Well, hi guys, it's that time. It's our Bible teaching snippet of the day. Well, today I want to do a wrap up. This will be part three of a deeper look at 1 John 1 9. Okay, this will be part three. Uh, I've been asking some questions, okay? And here's one of the questions, okay? Is John here in uh, 1 John giving us a formula? Was that his purpose, was to give us uh, a sinner's prayer for salvation? confessing our sins so that Jesus can forgive us? Or was he even trying to give us a maintenance prayer so that we can stay saved? Yesterday I asked if that's the case, are we the makers of our own faith, okay? Saying a sinner's prayer makes us the beginning point. And uh, if it's a maintenance prayer, aren't we the ones that's finishing our salvation? Uh, so are we the founder and finisher of our faith, or is all of that on Jesus? Uh, I think what John is doing is t trying to tell us something totally different. Now, here's a, my new question for today, all right? Here's some, well, I got two. I always have lots of questions, okay? In fact, I tell you, let me say it like this, okay? Religion generally teaches its followers not to ask questions. No, just to blindly believe what you're taught and shut up, okay? And But have we ever considered that the healthiest way to grow is to ask questions? Isn't that what little children do? Didn't Jesus say to enter the kingdom of heaven we have to enter as little children? Little children have lots and lots of questions. Did you know I never get mad at my little Eli for asking me questions? I see the hunger in him to want to know more, and I want him to know more because he's hungry to know more. So uh, is it really healthy for us not to ask questions? Did you know the only thing that doesn't grow is dead things, and I don't want to be dead in religion? Here's my other question that I was going to ask. I, not, I really want you to think about this. When are we made one with Christ? Is it when we say a sinner's prayer? Going back to what I just said, that would make us the foundation of our own faith or the founder of our own salvation. Uh, I believe we were made one with Christ during creation, okay, and uh, even before the foundations of the world were ever laid. But we can talk about that another day, but it's a good question to ask. Always ask questions. Now, uh, that's enough of my intro, okay? What I told you I thought I wanted to do, okay, I wanted to wrap this up today by just reading uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 9, and I'm going to go up to verse 8 today in this particular translation, all the way down through uh, the second chapter of John, and I believe I might go as far as 2-2, uh, okay? But I want to read this to you out of the mirror translation, and yes, it is different. But sometimes we need different, so it opens our eyes and loosens our thinking up. It gets the junk out of the trunk, the stinking thinking that's been put in there by religion. So let me do this today. I'm going to read this to you, and I didn't want to try to do it yesterday because I think I, I owe it to this teaching and uh, to go slow enough where all of us can understand it and get it. And I don't want to rush this, okay? Because you will find freedom in knowing that you're not the maker of your salvation, nor are you the keeper of your salvation. God has that, okay? Jesus has that for us. So here we go. Let me start here in uh, the Mirror Bible, and this is chapter 1, uh, verse 8. To claim innocence by our own efforts under the law of personal performance is to deceive ourselves and to deliberately ignore the truth. The truth about you does not mean that you now have to go into denial if you have done something wrong. When we communicate what God says about our sins, okay, we discover that he believe, what he believes concerning our redeemed oneness and innocence. We are cleansed from every distortion we believed about ourselves. Likeness and redeemed. So what he's saying here is that when we will come into agreement with God about things that we are off the path on, missing the target, our sins, then uh, we communicate that we agree with God. Then uh, 
we, it says what he believes concerning us, we're agreeing with God what he believes about us, and we're cleansed, purified of all the distortions that we believe about ourselves. Okay. Uh, let me, and I, he's got the same note in here that I have taught on for four years. Homoglio means to say the same thing, to speak the same thing, okay? Uh, my next part here, this is going to be verse 10. If we judge ourselves innocent by the law of our own works, we make Jesus Christ and what his word and his blood communicate within us irrelevant, okay? It's pretty clear. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 1. My darling children, the reason I write these things to you is so that you will not believe a lie about yourselves. If anyone does not believe a distorted image to be their reality, we have Jesus Christ who defines our likeness face to face with the Father. Here's what I talked to you about yesterday. He, Jesus, is our paraclete. Uh, it's parakletos in the Greek. The one who endorses our true identity. Being uh, both, let me find that. Being both the source and the reflection of the Father's image in us. Okay. And the, I, now what I want to do is I want to talk to you about some of his footnotes because they're so rich in understanding and knowledge about what the true Greek is trying to teach us in this verse. The root sin is to believe a lie about yourself. You think about that. Adam and Eve believed a lie. Humankind has been believing a lie about who they are. That's how people get trapped into sin. Let me keep going on some more of these footnotes. And it says here, and I talked to you about this yesterday, paraclete. And here's his words. He says, uh, sadly, this word has been translated as advocate as if Jesus needs to persuade the Father to like us and even possibly to forgive us. Uh, it says here, uh, parakletos meaning close companion, kinsman, John 14, 16. And yesterday I talked to you about that. I mentioned that uh, this word parakletos that was translated as Advocate, that means that God's going to intercede for us and try to step in between an angry God and say, okay, calm down, calm down, Dad. And he's going to try to talk God into what right here the Mirror Bible says for God to like us. But I want to go back to that just real quick today, okay? And I want to uh, show you what it says in uh, the different translations about this word. This word parakletos is in four places in the New Testament, okay? And uh, we find it in John chapter 14, verse 26, uh, John 15, 26, and John chapter 16, verse 7. Three times there. And then in this letter, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 1 and 2, okay? That is the word that was translated uh, advocate. And if you look in the King James and a lot of other Bibles, okay, not just the King James, you will see in 1 John it is translated as advocate, but in all the other three places it is said to be the comforter. And it's the exact same Greek word, okay? Now the Jonathan Mitchell that I've been reading to you from uh, uh, in this little teaching series, okay, about uh, this verse, the Jonathan Mitchell all of these, all four of these uh, translations, he always uses the exact same uh, wording, and he uses, and I'm going to try to read it to you if I can find it real quick. Uh, it says here, we constantly have the one called alongside to help, to give relief, to guide us toward the Father. We continuously possess a paraclete face-to-face, uh, with the Father. So, see, he's using that same verbiage in all of these different translations. Uh, let me see if I took a picture of these other translations. I think I did because I wanted to read that to you. Here's John chapter 14, verse 26 in the Jonathan Mitchell New Testament. Now, the helper, the one called alongside to aid, comforter, encourage, and bring relief, the paraclete, the set-apart Holy Spirit, See, which the Father will proceed sending within and in union with my name. This is Jesus talking. The one 
will progressively teach you all things, everything, and will continually reminding you of everything which I myself have said to you. Okay? And it also, it can, I can keep going. And I am, and, uh, I am continuously sending off to peace, peace to you people. So uh, what I'm saying here is in all four of those verses, it's telling us that, you know, Jesus isn't coming to stand between an angry God, his father, and, 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 and uh, all these guilty human beings, okay? And every time, uh, you know, his father starts acting like a schizophrenia per, uh, father, parent, and he wants uh, to get angry and strike out at us, Jesus is standing there, no, 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 don't do it, no, no, no. And, and sometimes that's how it's read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 is the advocate is one who basically takes uh, our side or our defense, and he's standing there trying to convince the Father not to hurt us and get even with us. And did you know that's exact? That is not what uh, he's saying here in uh, chapter two, verse one. He's saying that Jesus is always there, right beside the Father. The two of them are trying to convince us of who we are and who they are. Jesus isn't trying to convince God the Father to believe who he says we are to the Father. Right the opposite of that. He is working with the Father to get us to believe who we are and who they are. I pray that this little wrap-up of uh, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 has blessed you. Now, I do want to keep talking about how we've misrepresented and believe a lot of the wrong things about uh, what it means to be saved and uh, the false doctrine of hell. But for today, I'm going to call it a good one. I'm going to let you go. And before I hang up on you, you know, I'm always going to tell you that I love you because I really do. And I will see you again right here tomorrow. Bye-bye.